We're going to be in Exodus 19 and 20 today, which is basically the people of God coming before Mount Sinai. So let's look at it if we could. Now in the third month, now there's been several attempts through here to date. Notice in 12 verse 6 and notice in 16 1, it's been, you know, one month out, two months out. Now three months out, or really it's the third full moon, okay? The sons of Israel had gone from the land of Egypt on the very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Now we've talked about the wilderness of Sinai is in the southern area of Arabia, we believe. The wilderness of Zin is related to Sinai, we think. Uh, maybe... Uh, S-I-N is not, of course, uh, the moral connotation of the Bible. It's the idea of maybe a clay kind of dirt or uh, low scrub trees, and we're just not sure. There's some debate about where Sinai is, but the traditional site is Jebel Musa, which is one of the larger peaks in the southern uh, Sinai Peninsula today. And they set out from Rephidim. Now this, of course, was back in chapter 17 where they griped against Moses and God had to intervene. The whole history of this wilderness wandering experience was the people griping at Moses and Aaron and griping at God for how bad they have it. Notice it says, And they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, uh, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Now if you remember back in uh, Exodus 3.12, it's where Moses was told by God, you'll not know for sure that I'm with you until you bring the people back to this mountain. And of course, it's where the burning bush occurred. This is where uh, apparently Moses was uh, pasturing Jethro's flock. It may have always been a holy mountain. We're just not sure. Now, something very significant happens here in this context. Beginning in Exodus 19, all the way through the end of Exodus, all the way through the book of Leviticus, and all the way through Numbers 10, for the most part, we have the law that was communicated to, uh, from God through Moses to the people as they were at the foot of the mountain. There is a few brief historical narrative passages. For the most part, it's legislation. Now, that's different because the earlier part of Exodus has been basically historical narrative. Uh, notice, if you would, then, where it says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel. Now, this almost seems like an introduction to the Ten Commandments that we'll find uh, in Exodus chapter 20. It seems to me the Ten Commandments are really the essence of God's communication to Moses, and the, the uh, book of the covenant, which is going to be Exodus 21 through 23, is an amplification of the Ten Commandments, and then the rest of the Torah, or the law, is going to be an amplification of the Book of the Covenant. So this is the central heart of it right here. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' rings and brought you to myself. I've heard people characterize, particularly from the Lutheran tradition, the idea about the Old Testament is law and the New Testament is grace. But I think when you see it in context, the Old Testament is much the grace of God, the initiating grace of God, as is the New. Uh, God promised he was going to, he called Abraham. He promised Abraham he was going to deliver his uh, people who were going to go into bondage in Egypt. So here we have grace coming before the law. God acted on Israel's behalf before Israel ever responded in obedience to the law. Now, obedience is important, but grace always comes first. Now, this how I bore you on eagle's wings. What an important thing this is. This is a feminine metaphor. Uh, it probably refers to a Palestinian vulture. Um, but anyway, it's the mother of this species that carries the babies on her pinions as she pushes them out of the nest and teaches them to fly. Uh, so here we have God using a feminine metaphor to describe his love and care and provision for Israel. And of course, it, it is uh, well known in the natural world how uh, tenacious mothers are in the care of their young, deliberative, compassionate. God says, I'm like that. Matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, uh, he describes the spirit as a bird brooding over the waters. Matter of fact, Jesus in the gospel one time described his love for Jerusalem as a chicken wanting to a, a hen wanting to gather her chicks together. So God does speak uh, quite often from this feminine point of view. God is not a woman. God is not a man. God is a spiritual being, the ultimate spiritual being, and maleness and femaleness is his design. He incorporates the best uh, in himself. Notice it says, verse 5, Now then, if you indeed obey my voice. Now here is the conditional nature of the covenant. In my opinion, all our relationships with God are based on God's initiating love and our faith response. 
I know there are some covenants like the one with Noah that doesn't seem to have a particular response demanded, but that's caught up in God's plan for the redemption of the race. Uh, the covenant with Abraham was certainly conditional. The covenant with Moses is certainly conditional. The New Testament concept of uh, a justification by repentance and faith is conditional. I think all of our, our relationship to God are based on our faith response to his initiating love. So notice the if-then condition. If you listen to my voice and keep my covenant. Now this is the first use of the term covenant. We think the term has three possible etymologies of which we're not sure. The words in Hebrew are very close. Some say it means to eat. It's the concept of of a meal settling a covenant between these uh, nomadic tribes. Some say no, it comes from the word to bind, meaning to bind two together. No, some say it comes from the word between, which means be between two parties. In connection with the term covenant, bereath in the Old Testament, use it as the idea of to cut a covenant, meaning something died for the covenant to be made. Um, and that may refer to a meal or it may refer to the consequences of breaking the covenant. Notice the term covenant is singular here. I personally believe in one overarching covenant, Old Testament and new, between God and man, but with several different aspects. And, and I think when you see that, you know that the whole history of the Bible is God trying to redeem his wayward fallen creation. And when you see it in that light, the Bible takes on a brand new picture, a brand, a brand new focus. I think we're going to see it here in this covenant. Notice where it says, and you shall be, and there's two things basically, really three things basically said here. You will be my own possession. Now, I think King James has peculiar treasure, uh, but that uh, doesn't communicate to uh, our modern world too well. Uh, we learn from second, First Chronicles, I believe. Let me see if I can see it. Yes, First Chronicles 29.3. This is used for a king's special treasure. Uh, do you collect things? Uh, there's things that you like to go and look at from time to time. Maybe you collect stamps and you thumb through it. Or uh, maybe you collect gold and you go and look at your gold. Maybe you uh, uh, collect old coins or something and you, at time to time. That's what this is, that very special thing the king kept close to him. So he could look at and, and uh, rejoice in. Israel was that to God. They were the king's special treasure, Yahweh being the king. Notice, secondly, um, among all the peoples of the earth. Now, it's significant to me that all the peoples of the earth are mentioned, for all the earth is mine. Now, here's the thrust of monotheism. There is one and only one God. He created the earth. The earth belongs to him. All nations belong to him. And in context of its day, this was a radical, surprising statement in the sense of the national deities in which this sur was surrounded. Notice, if you will, where it says, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Now, this is very significant. Uh, this is the Old Testament background for the uh, Reformation principle, and I think Pauline principle of the priest to the believer. Now, basically what we have here, there were no priests yet. Back in Exodus 13, we had the dedication of the firstborn to God, but so far in Exodus, Aaron and his children haven't been dedicated to take the place of the firstborn. So this may refer to the sense of how a man acted as a mediator between God and his family. Anyway, it says you're going to be a kingdom of priests. You're going to be a nation to represent all the world to me. Now this shows, first of all, that Israel was not chosen because she was especially loved. She was chosen for a purpose. In the Old Testament, the term chosen does not mean uh, predestinated uh, love and salvation like it does in the New Testament. It means chosen for a purpose. Even Cyrus, who is not a believer, is called God's Messiah, idea, anointed one for a special task. Even Assyria is called the God of uh, the rod of my anger. So the Jews are not especially loved, but they're especially called to a purpose. I think we need to see that. And this is the concept of the, uh, uh, of the people of God being mediators of who God is to the rest of mankind. Notice also that in the New Testament, these very same titles is applied to the church. We see that uh, in 1 Peter 2, verses 5 and 9, and Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. It is my opinion that the church is spiritual Israel, and that is Israel forfeited her right for the uh, priesthood to all the world. The church has picked that up. Now, I know that labels me as a non-dispensationalist, but I hope you can overlook that. <laughs> Notice, if you would, then, it says, a holy nation. Here's the third thing they're going to be. Holy meaning set apart, but set apart with the implication of set apart for a divine task. And so I see from the very beginning the redemptive plan of God. I go back personally to Genesis 3.15, where there's a proto-evangelism, it's called. God even talks about the Messiah, and the Messiah is going to set his people free, bring his people back to him. And so I think we see it right here. Um, let's see. Notice if you would, uh, and, 
and thus you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Notice verse 7. So Moses came and called the elders. The elders are going to rep. There's, there's probably either a million and a half to three million people. The elders are going to represent Moses to them. He couldn't speak to that many. Even old megaphone couldn't do that. So the idea here is to speak to the elders and they'll take the message to the tribes. And the people said, all the Lord has spoken, we will do in verse 8. Now I think they really mean that. I think they really thought they could. The history of the Old Testament is that they couldn't. The Old Testament, seen in through the eyes of Galatians chapter 3, was a way of showing man that when he really wanted to do the will of God, he couldn't. It's almost like uh, the Old Testament counterpart of Romans chapter 7. It's God showing us that we need him, that we can't follow him even when we want to. That's why the new covenant had to be put in place, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. God's not going to relate with us based on our ability to keep his law, but he's going to change our nature, that from the inside out we're want, going to want to be like him. He's going to make us like him, and therefore we're going to want to keep his law, but he's going to deal with us in grace, not in merit. That's very important we see that. Notice if you would then where it says in verse 10, or excuse me, in verse 9 it says, The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I shall come to you in a thick cloud. Now, there's three reasons that God came in a, in a thick cloud. Number one, it was already the symbol of God's presence in the uh, escape from Egypt, okay? I think so they saw that. And all the people may hear when I speak to you. Uh, they're going to know God. That's God speaking. It's representing his physical presence. And number two, that they may also believe in you forever. They're going to, when God comes to Moses in this unique way, the people are going to respect Moses, know that Moses speaks for God. And thirdly, I think, though not mentioned here, though it is mentioned in verse 21, the idea of God hiding himself in a cloud lest the people see him uh, and die. And so I think that's what we have here. Now notice, if you would, where it mentions uh, the idea about let them wash their garments. Now, what we have here is the concept of outward washing as a symbol of inner washing. Or we, we often say in, the, in the, the Baptist church that baptism is an outer sign of an inner change. That's basically what we have here. These washing of clothes and abstaining from sexual relationships were only symbols of an inner change, an inner desire to be uh, holy, pure, set apart for God. Now, notice it says, this idea about washing garments, we find it quite often here. We find it in Numbers 8-7, Numbers 19-19, Numbers 24-15. Uh, there's even an expression of this back in uh, Genesis 35, 2. Notice it says in three days they're going to do this, and the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai. God didn't live there as the Olympic, uh, uh, the Greek and Roman gods lived on Mount Olympus. God came to the mountain for one purpose, to reveal to Moses. The mountain wasn't holy until God was there. The Jews even didn't make a big deal about remembering the location of the mountain because this was not significant. God dwelt everywhere, but he's particularly going to be with his people. Okay? Now, and you shall set bounds for the people all around, saying... They're going to set bounds on the uh, mountain, I think. The, the Samaritan Pentateuch has the word mountain. So I think it's, they're going to set bounds around this mountain. The mountain's going to become holy because God there. And God's got to show the people that holiness I is a high price to pay when you're dedicated to God. Now, notice if, if anybody touches the mountain or comes near, they'll be put to death. Why? Because they violated something? No, because they've become holy, too holy to intermingle with people. And notice verse 13, no hand shall touch them because they'd become holy. They're going to be killed by stoning or, sh or shooting with an arrow or spear. Maybe this is the, the uh, 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 precursor to the idea of the death penalty in Israel was by stoning. To keep on from passing on either the corruption or the holiness. The ram's horn here is the Zophar. Uh, it's that special horn that the Jews use for religious purposes and for military purposes. Notice that uh, it says, don't go near a woman. Now, why is that? Does that mean the sexual act is somehow uh, nasty and dirty and God doesn't want us to do it? No. Uh, sex is God's idea. Now, you have to look at the, the uh, Hebrew mentality. We learn from Semites that somehow at holy times and in holy places they abstain from sex. Even Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians 7 uh, about the idea that there's a time of prayer where a couple would go apart, abstain from sexual relations for the act of praying. Notice also it's, it's uh, the Hebrew view of the body, bodily admissions as being evil, that any kind of fluid that leaves the body makes one unholy, uh, uh, unclean. Notice also the idea of sexual abstinence is part of the preparation of purification. I want to see 1 Samuel 21, 4 and 5, 2 Samuel 11, 6 through 11, and also the fact that uh, somehow the fertility worship of the surrounding nations, uh, the Israelites wanted to be very different in their preparation to meet God and not do it in a sexual act. Maybe that's involved here. Now in verse 16, on the third day God came down on the mountain, you might want to see Deuteronomy 4, 
um, 11 and 12 here for a parallel. It came in thunder and lightning. and uh, Now, this is the idea of God as a thunderstorm showing the power of God. It says a very loud trumpet sound. We're not sure if that's supernatural or if that's the, the uh, people blowing the trumpet, but it seems to be a supernatural thing here. The, Moses, the people came out to meet Moses. My, what a uh, surprising thing this was. Be. Moses, I meet mean, God. Moses went up on the mountain to meet God, and the whole congregation quaked. Now, the Septuagint here says the mountain quaked, and that's the idea, I think, not the people quaked, though I think they did. It's the idea of the mountain shaking because God came down. And he's saying, was this, was this a volcano? I don't think this is a volcano eruption. I think this is, is a strong thunderstorm. No, I think it's a supernatural manifestation of God is what we have here. Now, the word thunder can mean voice or thunder in Hebrew. It's coal, and so I don't know which it is. Notice in verse 22 and 24, again, we're mentioning the priest. And there aren't any priests yet. This is kind of a way of when you wrote, Moses later wrote this, he kind of read back into an earlier account, this later designation of priest. Now we come to chapter 20, which is, of course, the Ten Commandments. Now, I'm not going to go over this in real detail uh, in the outline you get, uh, if you hope you subscribe to that. Uh, I have given you an extensive outline on every one of these commandments, and uh, we'll deal basically uh, with the outline in detail. Let me do a precursor overview here. Notice, first of all, that there is a similarity between this law code, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, the Decalogue, uh, and other ancient law codes. We, we have many examples of both Sumerian and Babylonian law codes. There is a degree to which they are the same pattern. But there is also a, a, a uniqueness to the Hebra uh, Hebraic ones. And so I think we see that God always speaks to man in his culture, but he speaks to God with the fullness of who he is. So most of us are historically conditioned to receive the word of God through that which we understand from our culture, and yet it's a unique word. The, the Ten Commandments are that kinds of things. They seem to be broken into two halves. Uh, now I don't think there's two, I don't think there's, there's Two different, one side, one, one half is on one stone and one half on the other. I personally believe there's two separate copies. And that goes back to the Hittite Suzerian treaties that are very similar to these law codes. Uh, and they're from the, the second millennium BC, which shows the historicity of this account. And these Suzerian law codes changed in the, in the next millennium, so we know that Moses really is a part and parcel of the day he claimed to be. Now, basically, we have one side that deals with God's uh, relationship to the people or the people's love and trust for God. On the other side, we deal with the, the people as they relate to the, the covenant community. And I think that says to us that if, if we love God, we're going to act a certain way toward our fellow man. And the uniqueness of God is going to be brought out here. Uh, the desire of man to worship God and God alone is the emphasis that we have. Notice it says then, So Moses went down to the people and told them, uh, then God spoke all those words, saying, now here we have it's God's revelation, not Moses. This same thing is repeated in Deuteronomy 5, and we have some aspects of this, again, repeated in Exodus 34. So it's not one time only. I am the Lord your God. This is Yahweh, the covenant name for God, uh, your Elohim. Now here are the two names for God that some try to find different sources in the Pentateuch, but I think that's reading too much of our critical view of literature. I think it's just the God uh, of uh, all the earth. Elohim, and he comes uniquely to these, the Jews, Yahweh, to deliver all the earth. Now notice it says, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Here is the fact that God acts. The idols, they don't act. You, they don't listen. They're not gods at all. But God hears and comes and acts. It's a God who acts. And notice he acts in grace to bring you out of the house of slavery. And, of course, that's exactly what he did. This becomes so important. The Exodus experience, the Ten Commandments, the wilderness wandering, those are major historical acts. The Jews go back to time and time again uh, to remind them of the gracious care for God. Over, It's a very important time. Uh, you should not have any of the gods before me. And this word before means beside, around. It's often used of taking a second wife. It's the idea, I'm a sugenus. There's no. I'm in nobody's category. I'm totally different. I'm unique. I, I, I'm the uh, only one, I'm, so it's the idea of going back again to monotheism. Now, I do believe that full-blown philosophical, ontological uh, monotheism is not really defined and expressed until the 8th century prophets, particularly Amos, Hosea, Micah, uh, and Isaiah. But we see foreshadowings of it, implications of it in these earlier writings. Notice it says, um, and you shall not make for yourself in an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven, above or the earth beneath, or in the water underneath the earth. Now, what's the problem of this? God's saying, you can't represent me with animals. The other nations had animals to represent God. Different uh, aspects of the animals' characteristics, they had their, their gods. God said, no, I'm too different. Uh, I don't want you to characterize me in an animal. I, I, I am the God who is everywhere. I'm the creator. 
And so he doesn't want any likeness. Now, this is not saying so much that you can't make any likeness of things in heaven because in the temple, there's going to be cherubim and oxen in the temple things. It's God you can't make a representation of. That's why the sin of the golden calf in Exodus 32 is so horrendous. It was trying to put in an, a God into an object. Notice if you would when it says, uh, verse 5, You shall not worship them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God. That's very important to me. Here's a love word. Uh, God is to his people as a passionate lover. You might want to see Hosea chapters 1 through 3. Uh, God's saying, I I'm jealous for you. I want you to know me and me alone. You say, that's a, that's a powerful word. Yes, it is. But it shows the character of God. I think it's very important here. Notice in verse 6, but showing loving kindness to thousands. Now, in Deuteronomy 7, 9, it says to thousand generations. Isn't that amazing? That sometimes the evil is passed on to the third and fourth generation. Now, whether that means lifestyle uh, uh, priorities or lifestyle uh, uh, sins, I'm not sure. Uh, I think more and more I'm learning that sometimes the sins of the father are committed to the children, especially in the area of witchcraft or divination or that kind of thing. Sometimes familiar spirits may be passed on through families. Uh, and if that's what this is talking about, I'm not sure. But notice, that compare the three and four generations to the thousands generation. One time in Isaiah, Isaiah called God's judgment, God's strange work. Here we see the real nature of God. Love to a thousand generations, evil to three and four. My goodness, isn't that wonderful? Friends, I want to tell you, God's for us. God is a God of love, compassion. God wants you to know him. He's not going to hold your sins against you. He knows that we're but, but, but dust, Psalms 103, but he wants us to know him. I often wonder uh, sometimes in our families, uh, my own example, I wonder how many generations back a great Christian may have impacted my life by God's faithfulness. Now, see, we in America are so into individualism. We forget the corporate blessing of being the people of God. I expect my great, great, great grandchildren to have an impact because of my faith and love for God. Notice it says there's condition to those who love me and keep my commandments. Obedience is crucial. Uh, God expects us to obey. Now we sin and rebel and all of us do, but God expects us to obey. Obedience is important. Um, Jesus said it over and over again. I think it's Luke um, 646. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I tell you to do? Obedience is crucial for maturity, for joy, and for service. Uh, notice it mentions here the word loving kindness is that special Hebrew word for faithfulness and love. Uh, remember the Sabbath day? This goes back to uh, creation. It's interesting to me that here the account in uh, Exodus is much more uh, religious and theological, while the same account in Deuteronomy 5 is slightly different, it's much more social. Uh, this is God at Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy is, is Moses going back and slightly adapting that, not for nomadic society, but for a settled society in Canaan. He puts it more in the social reasons for the Sabbath. This puts it in the religious reasons. It goes back to Genesis chapter 2. Uh, the Sabbath, the seven-day cycle, is uniquely Hebraic. We don't find it in Babylon. We don't find it in Egypt. It is a unique thing of the people of God. Then we move in the second half of this code, which is basically man's relationship to man. And what it shows is that how we treat others it impacts our own life. And, of course, this starts out with the idea of honoring father and mother. Notice the equality of the parents. I think here we see the priority of the family. The family unit gives stability to society. This that you may prolong your days is not so much an individual promise of longevity, but a societal promise for stability. This same little phrase, prolong your days, is found several other places uh, in the Pentateuch where it does not refer to honoring parents. So I think it's societal, not individual. Notice about murder. This is not thou shalt not kill, King James. This is premeditated, non-legal murder. Now, there was a premeditated legal murder. That's the, the uh, kinsman redeemer, the goel. But this is the, the premeditated non-legal murder. So it'd be, uh, uh, that, that's a better, con this has nothing to do about war or anything like that. Uh, capital punishment, not here. Now the idea of adultery is not so much that the sex act is bad, but it is the priority of the family, particularly the tribal inheritance that gets terribly messed up in adultery and, and, and those kind of things. So in its context, it's not that sex is the, the big problem. It's the mixing up of the tribes in inappropriate ways involving the inheritance rights. I noticed about the stealing is the idea about treating your covenant brother with disrespect. And all of these are that, murdering, adultery, steal, bear false witness. We've got to act toward our covenant partner because he's our covenant partner. We've got to treat him in a unique way because we both have the same God. We show God how we love him by how we treat others called by his name. 
That's one of the horrors of denominationism when we get so arrogant at nitpicking toward others called in Jesus' name. It is not good, my brothers. It should not be so. Now, the ideal about covet here is, of course, this inner attitude. It kind of caps out the Ten Commandments that not only is outward acts important, but our attitude or motive is crucial. God looks at the heart before he looks at the act. And many times we may not steal a man's wife or steal a man's property or lie about him, but behind the scene, we wish he was dead. We wish we had his wife. We, we wish we could bear false witness. And basically, we learn from Jesus in Matthew uh, 5, uh, 17, down all the way to the end of the chapter, that it's the motive that's crucial, not just the act. And that's hard for us because we struggle with that. It's our, it's our loving God in such a way that it impacts every aspect of life, not just the outward aspects, but the inner aspects. If I can put it in terms of uh, Old Testament, it's not just the body that needs to be circumcised as a sign of the covenant. The covenant needs to have a circumcised heart. It's the attitude that informs. Now, that is both Old Testament and New. The Old Testament is meant to be attitude just as the New. But what God's going to do is give us a new nature because our old nature, as much as it wants to serve God, can't. And then we have in verse 18 a whole different section that runs through... Uh, uh, Chapter 23 is called the Book of the Covenant. And again, I think it's an amplification of the Ten Commandments. And then this Book of the Covenant is going to be amplified into the whole Pentateuch. And so we see this as a core. I've given you extensive notes, and I hope you'll look at those. Uh, I've enjoyed being with you. It's a tremendous time, the people of God before the mountain. Wow, isn't that wonderful? I hope this is not just an Old Testament thing, but it's God's will for man in society. And it's really how we ought to live with our fellow man. It won't, it won't save us. Can't keep this and make us safe. We're not saved by merit. But it is a way that once we're right with God, this is a way to, to live pleasing to him. I've enjoyed being with you. God bless you.